In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Well, my brothers and sisters in Christ, welcome to this program entitled Learning to Live in God's Divine Will. After Christmas and before New Year, we, um, well, actually our New Year, we celebrate Jesus' divine birth and the mothership, the motherhood of the queenship of Mary. Mary is both mother and queen, and they two are intimately connected. The motherhood of Mary entitles her to have her queenship. Inasmuch as she is the mother of the family of the whole church, not just Christ, but by virtue of Christ, is mother of the whole family of the church, she therefore is also the queen. You know, this reminds me of the old Roman Empire, the Roman family. They had a similar patriarchal and matriarchal society. And I would like to use this as a way of, by way of introduction to talk about the docility of the Holy Family of Nazareth that we celebrated a few days ago after Christmas, as well as our docility toward the Holy Spirit, who is the sanctifier in these end times. Without docility to the Holy Spirit, there can be no living in God's divine will. So I will talk about the family unit. In the Holy Family of Nazareth, in the Roman Empire, which preceded the Holy Family of Nazareth, and in our lives, inasmuch as we are members of the family of Christ, members of the one mystical body of Christ, the Holy Family, universal. And tie this into the presentation of Our Lady, where she presents the child Jesus as the mother of God to Simeon. And reflect upon the examples of Saints Peter and Paul to better understand this virtue of docility to the Holy Spirit. Whenever we are trying to grow in virtue, we always are mindful of the need for two things. Number one, meditation, and number two, contemplation. Meditation is us actively engaging our mind, our will, whether it's to <clears throat> engender certain thoughts, ideas, images in our mind, words that present a, an ambience, an environment, a landscape in which we can now assimilate with the sentiments of Jesus, Mary, of the events we're meditating upon. So the events of Jesus and Mary, let's say the birth of our Lord, the Nativity, has, has in itself certain events. So you have the event of the Nativity itself, but within that event you have the cold air, the darkness, and the cold of the cold night, the solitude, the silence, the animals, the smell of the animals. Okay, you have all these things going on in Nazareth. And this provides us with material, raw material by which we enter into meditation. So we create the scenery, so to speak, engaging our intellect, our imagination, and our will. But then God assists us. Once we do our part, then God does his part. And he draws us into contemplation. And now the act of imagination gives way to the passive imagination, allowing God to produce his images, his inspiration, his words within us. Parenthetically, I should add that John of the Cross always puts a warning here saying that if in this moment of contemplation we receive certain words that we feel we should share with others or certain ideas, don't do so unless you first present it to a wise spiritual priest or guide, because the devil can always enter into that part of the mind, the imagination, okay? Now, docility to the Holy Spirit is a virtue that is cultivated by meditation and contemplation. Of course, it's by action as well. We have to put into practice what we know. And um, Luisa Picaretta, the author of 
the writings that expound this gift of living in God's divine will more than any other in the history of the church emphasizes this virtue. For example, in volume 3, June 3, 1900, Jesus reveals to her, lack of esteem of for others is lack of true Christian humility and docility. Because a humble and docile spirit knows how to respect everyone and always interprets the things of others in a positive light. Now, this is an important passage I will refer back to because it resonates with the event of the fourth joyful mystery, where Mary presents the child with Joseph. Joseph and Mary present the child, Jesus, to Simeon. But before I go into that virtue of docility and how it applies to us today in these end times of mercy and love, but also of tremendous confusion, on the part of the enemy to distract us from this outpouring of grace, love, and mercy. I wish to talk about the family of the Roman Empire that provides us with a context in which the Holy Family of Nazareth lived. At the time of the birth of Christ, there was a lot of genocide going on. Tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands, of babies were being dispatched one after the other with the decree and the permission of the law of the Roman Senate. Now, in the Roman family, which is called the familia, we had the oldest male as the patriarch, known as you know, the pater familias. The patriarch was the oldest man in the household, and his children, his son's children, and his grandchildren, and his slaves were under his authority. Now, for wealthy families, that could mean several hundred people under his charge. And the oldest man's children, young and grown, male and female, married and unmarried, were all under his control until he died. Imagine that. Imagine your grandfather, even your great-grandfather, if he's the oldest, having control over what you do, even if you're a married man. All members of the immediate family, including the wife, were under the authority of the pater familias. Oh, some people think, you know, that love old ways, I, 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 I long for those days. Well, let's not long for these days, please, because they weren't so great, you know. Not for the woman, not for the children, not for the married people, but they were great for the guy. But that's not how you construct a holy family like the one patterned after that of Christ, Mary, and Jesus. So the pater familias, children, young, grown, married, unmarried, were under his authority and were legally part of his, his inheritance. And deep, dug deep into the Roman family law was this law that the father, if he didn't like the child, newly born, could dispatch of it, whether it was on account of a defect, physical, um, or um, mental. And this is a scary thought. So genocide was going on big time at the time of the birth of Christ. Now, if you reflect back for 2,000 years prior, you have Pharaoh enacting a law of genocide upon all the Egyptians. I'm sorry, upon all the Israelites. Pharaoh sent out a decree to kill the male children if they were born. He had all the maidservants dispatch of all the males because they, the Jews were becoming too numerous. And he was afraid, Pharaoh, that if they grew more in number, they would threaten his authority. And we find the same genocide act on the part of Herod Herod was an evil man, very evil. He killed many people, including his wife, his two sons-in-law. And then he wanted to kill all the firstborn because word came to him from the three wise men that a king of the Jews was to be born in Galilee, in Bethlehem. 
So he sent the wise men there under the pretext that he too wanted to render homage to the new king. But when the wise men did not return, about he waited about a year or two, he felt slighted. So he sent out courtiers with a decree to dispatch every male up to two years old in that district. And that's why the prophet speaks of a voice crying out in Rama. Rachel weeping for her children. So here we have three historical events where genocide was promoted throughout the whole land. In the lives of Moses and Pharaoh, in the lives of the Holy Family and Herod, and the lives of the citizens of the Roman Empire, at which it coincided with the genocide of Herod at the time of the Holy Family. So the Holy Family was born in this context of the pater familias. And these pater familias, the oldest men in the house, owned all the family property, with the exception of the wages earned by a grown son from, let's say, military service. And only at the death of the pater familias, the oldest man in the house, did his children finally become independent. You could imagine all the plots to take out the oldest male. And this law, enacted by the Roman Empire, the Senate in particular, was known as the sui iuris. Now, a father could choose to emancipate a grown son before his death. But that was completely up to the father. And the children took their father's name. All the children. And um, women were often discouraged from divorcing their husbands because any children were the property, you see, of the pater familias. He had the right to refuse her, his wife, any further contact with her children after a divorce. And he got that right from the Roman Senate. Even if her husband died while they were still married, his father could tell the widow that she could no longer see her children. Imagine that. And when children were born, the maidservants or even the the children would place the child newly born on the ground and the father would pass by and look at it. If he didn't like it, they would kill it. Or if he didn't feel he had enough economical resources to sustain it, He could still kill it, and that would be legal. So in this context of the killing of children, of the seeking of the death of Jesus and the killing of the holy innocents, which we celebrated a few days ago, guess what happens? The Messiah comes to us. There is a thing, a teaching in theology called biblical parallels, okay? Biblical parallels mean that what happened in the Old Testament will again happen in the New, but in greater intensity, whether it's good or bad. And we find this, you know, in the book of Exodus, where there was the darkening of the sun, the same darkening we find in the book of Revelation. We also find in Exodus the water turning blood red. We find the same thing in the book of Revelation. And the list goes on and on. So, just as these events of genocide occurred shortly before the coming of the Messiah, so it will be in the future. And that is why we are on the cusp of the return of our Lord, not in the flesh, that comes at the end of the world, but in the spirit. St. Bernard of Clairvaux, St. Augustine of Hippo, St. Cyril of Jerusalem, all three, and even the theologian, Father uh, Jacques Danielou, spoke of an intermediate coming of Christ. That is, Christ will return in the Spirit to establish on earth his kingdom in preparation for his final return in the flesh. So there's going to be an era of peace, as which is the expression Our Lady used at Fatima, 
before the final coming of Christ. Why? So that during this era of peace referred to in Revelation chapter 20 as a thousand years of peace prepares the church for its espousalship with Christ the Lamb at the Last Supper as reported in Revelation chapter 22. Christ cannot espouse his church until, as St. Paul says in his letter to the Ephesians, it is worthy to espouse its bridegroom. So the church must be without spot, stain, wrinkle, or blemish. But what's going to make the church, which is us, members of the church, immaculate, without spot, stain, wrinkle, or blemish? The Holy Spirit's purification, which will happen right before the return in spirit of Christ. So when Christ comes to us in the spirit, he will appear in the sky. And this has been reported by many spiritual authors, from prophets to mystics, that have received the church's magisterial official seals of approval, namely the imprimator and the And they range from Faustina, who speaks of this apparition of Christ in the sky, to um, many others. And they're reported in my book, The Splendor of Creation, which is endorsed by two bishops, as well as in my work, The um, Antichrist in the End Times. So there's going to be a worldwide culling of humanity, which we are experiencing now, it's starting already. And God will intervene, as he always does, with fire. St. Peter alludes to this intervention of God in his letter his first letter. He speaks of three heavens, three earths. The first heaven, he says, and earth were done away with the deluge, the flood, at the time of Noah. The present heavens and earth, that is the second heavens and earth in which we now live, Peter says, are reserved for fire. So once this fire comes, which Our Lady prophesied at Akita, Japan, which was approved by the local bishop, fire will fall from the sky, sparing neither laity nor priests. The good will suffer with the bad. The living will envy the dead, etc. This will last for a very brief time. Then there will be the third heavens, third earth. This is the era of peace. The reign of the divine will on earth. And I believe St. Paul, who had more mystical gifts than anyone in the whole Bible, experienced this in mystical vision. Why do I say that? Because he said he was taken to the third heaven. And he saw things that no human tongue can express. So consider that in this biblical parallel, there is a lot to hope for. Certainly, we're going to have to go through a lot of restrictions, a lot of stripping of our liberties and rights and privileges, right of assembly, right of speech, right of conscience, right of, you know, right of um, assembly. But... This is all portrayed already in the Bible. And we know what's going to happen by virtue of this teaching of biblical parallels. Christ is on the verge of returning, and he's coming, and he's going to breathe his Holy Spirit upon us. Like the Holy Spirit, the Ruach Yahweh in Hebrew, breathed in the nostrils of Adam. So the Holy Spirit will breathe upon all humanity in our nostrils, but it will be a fiery breath. And a remnant, as in the time of Noah, will remain. And this remnant will be a holy people, a royal priesthood, all of whom will bend and acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord. Every tongue will confess and every knee will bend, where the meek will inherit the earth. And it will be reduced to an agrarian society. We will return back to the earth from which we came to respect the earth and the planet and its resources, whereby spears will be transformed into pruning hooks. And as the book of the prophet Isaiah reports, plows into shears. This is all a depiction of the agrarian society that emerges from this chastisement. 
Now, we're not preaching here gloom and doom. We're preaching hope. Because there has to always be an upheaval, just like when there is a birth pain, labor pains, before there is a rebirth, a renewal. So we're experiencing the labor pains today, like never before in the history of the world. Now, the divine family is born in this context of genocide on the part of Herod and on the part of the Roman Empire. Into so much so that even Christ was threatened. So Joseph and Mary had to flee to Egypt and where they remained for several years. Ostensibly in Alexandria where there was a large Jewish community. And then they came back after the death of Herod and after Archelaus, his son, had taken over the reins. And this brings us to the context of docility again. In this context of abuse on the part of the state, we fast forward to the divine birth of Christ. After Joseph and Mary return from their exile in Egypt, they come back with a baby Jesus, a few years old, and then What do they do? They establish themselves in Nazareth. And in this context, they exemplify the virtue of docility that Louisa Picaretta describes in her childhood memoirs. And before I get to Jesus' exhortation of Louisa to observe the Holy Family and imitate their virtues, including docility, including that of docility, let me remind you that before Mary and Joseph had fled to Egypt, Mary had to have the child circumcised and then after 40 days presented in the temple. And we find in day 23 in the book entitled The Virgin Mary in the Kingdom of the Divine Will, the docility of Mary and Joseph in presenting the child Jesus to the temple. Now, remember the context. A woman has really no rights at this time. Joseph and Mary have very little money, so they cannot afford an ox or a lamb. They can only afford two turtle doves as an offering and atonement for sin on the behalf of Christ. But Christ did not have to be offered in the temple. He had no sin. But Mary and Joseph chose even though Christ was exempt from the Mosaic law to observe it, even though Christ was exempt from all ecclesiastical authority because he is God who gives ecclesiastical authority its purpose and meaning, to obey it, to submit himself to it, as did Jesus and Mary. So Mary describes on day 23 of this book, it's actually a both in two passages on day 23, and then there's an elaboration of this day 23 in the fourth meditation of the same book. And this elaboration was the fruit of St. Hannibal de Francia's request to Louisa to talk further about the event of the presentation in the temple. And here we find that at the end of the 40 days, Mary says, my dear baby Jesus, inebriated more than ever with love, wanted to obey the law, the Mosaic law by presenting himself in the temple to offer himself for the salvation of all. Now, this is docility. Now, I'm going to read this very slowly, and I want it to sink in because in reading this event of the presentation, we will grasp its meaning that has been hidden from many people, especially those people who badmouth the Pope who criticized the bishops and the priests openly and encourage others not to go to church to receive the sacraments. Certainly, we're all imperfect. There are good bishops, bad bishops, good priests, bad priests, good popes, bad popes, but the reverence and the respect that we are obliged by God to always uphold for them. 
is essential to the virtue of docility. And we find it right here in the example of Joseph and Mary and Jesus. And this will lead me to, as I mentioned earlier, the examples of St. Peter and Martin Luther. Now, before I read this, I want to just, so you understand my point better, I want to preface it by saying, while there are good and bad authorities in the church, we should never, ever lose respect of the dignity of their office, of the value of their office. You know that? If we do, we sin before God. And you may say, no, that's not true. God wants us to fight against these evil authorities and wants us to stand up and keep the traditions. Yes, he does, but never to the point of sinning back. And I, I'm, I have three or four themes in my head as I'm speaking, and I don't want to get off point. But I said I was going to talk about Martin Luther and Peter as a preface to what I'm going to read so I'll do that, but then I'll go to a second point that just came to my mind of the authority that we are bound by God to uphold with respect to the Pope, bishops, priests. And I will cite you to you, I will cite to you a passage from God the Father to Catherine of Siena. So first, St. Martin Luther and St. Peter. Martin Luther saw the abuse of the Catholic Church authorities at his time, right, in the, in the 16th century. Martin Luther saw this abuse, and he, to some extent manipulated by the um, German Episcopates who rebelled against Rome, chose to reform the Church from without. Okay. Now, in this time of the 16th century, Martin Luther... He had left the church. He severed himself from the church. So he cut out all the sacraments. I don't, we don't need the sacraments anymore. There's too much abuse there. Why even go there anymore? And some people are saying that today. And this is bad. Okay? St. Francis on the... I'm sorry. But earlier I said St. Martin Luther and St. Peter. I meant St. <laughs> Martin Luther and St. Francis because they were both just a couple of hundred years away from each other. And... Um, they both represent two different approaches, polar opposite approaches to um, how to reform the church. So about 250 years apart, St. Francis and Martin Luther chose different approaches. Martin Luther to leave the church to reform it. St. Francis to remain within it and reform it. St. Francis was given a commission by God to reform the church to bring back the value of simplicity and poverty, which the church at that time had grossly neglected. Just as St. Teresa of Avila and St. John of the Cross were given a commission to reform the church, and in particular, the Carmelite order. The Cals, so they became discalced, and they went back to a more authentic, primitive observance of the gospel. But in the process of reforming the church from within, St. Francis, St. John of the Cross, St. Teresa of Avila were persecuted by the very hierarchical members of the church. Now, you may be asking yourself, why on God's green earth would they even stay there and allow themselves to be beat up like this? Just leave, be done with it, and move on. But no, that is not docility. Look at St. Padre Pio who could have left the Capuchin order because he was persecuted by his own conquerors and superior and even the Vatican. I don't say the Vatican, but certain members within it, including the, the, the informants of Pope Pius XI, who told him that Padre Pio was fake and his stigmata was fake. And therefore, Pope Pius X revoked Padre Pio's faculties for 10 years, no public mass, no confessions for 10 years, no speaking or writing to a spiritual director for 10 years, no meeting with people in private in public audiences for 10 years. But Padre Pio remained within, even though it was the source of his persecution, in order to reform it. Now, this does not mean, there's a very fine line here, that every cross that is imposed upon us that is not from God but from Satan must be embraced. No, that's not what I'm saying. 
crosses that are evil should be shunned, like genocide, like abortion, like um, um, abuse of uh, moral teachings. Someone tells you something that's morally wrong, that's a sin, you don't do it, even if it's an ecclesiastical authority. But what I'm talking about is not teaching a person to sin, but rather persecuting a person. There's no sin required of that person, but the people that persecuting the person are sinning. You see the difference? Now, certainly a person may leave and move on to a different community or order like Father Benedict Rochelle or Mother Teresa of Calcutta to reform or start a new order. There's nothing wrong with that. But they're not trying to reform the church from without, you see. They're still staying within the church. My point is, docility, this docility of St. John of the Cross, St. Francis, St. Teresa of Avila, Mother Teresa of Calcutta, who's now a saint, is not found in Martin Luther. Now, I'm not saying by this that Martin Luther was an evil man and that he's condemned for all eternity, no. But I'm saying he was misguided. And certain of his decisions were even... Uh, um, exploited by the German Episcopate, who wanted him to be their poster boy, so to speak, to break from Rome, and he accepted it, and that was wrong. And this, and it is equally wrong for us today to openly badmouth Pope Francis and the bishops and the priests and encourage people to not follow them. This is a sin. You want me to, now I'll go on to St. Catherine of Siena's quote and then to the reading that I wish to share with you. Here, taken from the Dialogue of Divine Providence, which in Italian was simply called Il Libro, which means the book in Italian, because St. Catherine of Siena was not able to write very well. In chapter 20, God the Father reveals to her, I have manifested to you, showing you what reverence laity ought to have for my priests, whether they be good or evil, and how much irreverence toward them displeases me. I represented the mystical body of the Holy Church to you, Catherine, under the form of a cellar, in which cellar was the blood of my only begotten Son, Jesus Christ, which gives efficacy to all the sacraments. From him issues the whole order of priests, each of whom is placed in his particular office to administer the glorious blood of Christ. And as the Christ on earth was has chosen them for his helpers. Thank you for joining. The, the right of correcting their defects belongs to him alone. Let me repeat that sentence. I don't know, there was a little interruption while I was speaking. From Christ issues the whole order of priests, each of whom is placed in his particular office to administer the glorious blood of Christ. And as the Christ on earth has chosen these priests for his helpers, the right of correcting their defects belongs to him alone, and so I wish it to be. For I have withdrawn them from service and subjection to lay secular masters on account of the excellence and authority I have given them. Civil law has got nothing to do with their punishment. Let me repeat that again. This is God the Father talking to Catherine of Siena. Civil law has got nothing to do with the priest's punishment. That right is placed in Christ, whose office is to govern under the divine law, for these are my anointed ones. And inasmuch as I have said in the scripture, do not touch my Christs, my priests. No greater ruin can come upon man than to constitute himself their punisher. Now, what do you think now about openly bad-mouthing the priests and the bishops and the Pope? You see, certainly they have to be corrected. This is not what Christ, God the Father, is saying. He's not saying let them do whatever they want and sin to the point of them going to hell. No. He's saying let the church correct them. That's their authority. They ought to be corrected. And if the church is taking its time in correcting them, that doesn't justify us trumping the church's authority and 
taking authority in our own hands to correct them. No. Look at Judas Iscariot and Jesus Christ as an example. They all knew that Judas was stealing from the common purse, but Jesus let it go. Why did he do that? They all knew that Jesus was a thief, but they, Jesus let it go. Why did he do that? You see, God has his own time and his own laws and his own method of correction. And we have to respect it. We do what is within our competency to correct, but the rest we leave to God in his church. The church corrects the church, the state corrects the church, the state. Give to Peter what, um, give to the, what did Jesus say about the, the coin? When the Jews presented it to him and upon it, they showed the face of Caesar. Give to Caesar what is Caesar's, Caesar's and God to God what is God's. So Christ here, Jesus, I'm sorry, God the Father here tells Catherine of Siena, do not touch my Christ, my priests. No greater ruin can come upon man than to constitute himself their punisher. He continues, God the Father, to Catherine, the reverence you pray you pay to priests is not actually paid to them, but to me. In virtue of the blood I have entrusted to their ministry. If this were not so, you should pay them as much reverence as to anyone else and no more. It is this ministry of theirs that dictates that you should reverence them and come to them, not for what they are in themselves, but for the power I have entrusted to them. And if you would receive the sacraments of the church. So the reverence belongs not to the ministers. See, this is a critical distinction. He's saying you don't reverence the minister, the priest, but you reverence Christ within him. So he says, the reverence belongs not to the ministers, the priests, but to me. And to the glorious blood made one thing with me because of the union of divinity with humanity. And just as the reverence is done to me, so also is the reverence, oh, sorry, sorry, so also is the irreverence, for I have already told you that you must not reverence them for themselves, but for the authority I have entrusted to them. Therefore, you must not sin against them. Because if you do, you are really sinning, not against them, but against me. This I have forbidden, and I have said that it is my will that no one should touch them. For this reason, no one has any excuse to say, I am doing no harm, nor am I rebelling against the Holy Church. I am simply acting against the sins of evil priests. Such persons are deluded, blinded as they are by their own selfishness. It is me they assault, Christ, just as, as it was me they reverenced. To me redounds every assault they make against my priests, derision, slander, disgrace, abuse. Whatever is done to them, I count as done to me. So, and he goes on. I'll stop right there. Now, this docility in the face of abuse of ecclesiastical authority at the time of Martin Luther at the time of, um, let's say, Jesus Christ, where the synagogue leaders abused him, mocked him, falsely leveled accusations against him, Mary and Joseph, knowing that this would happen in the life of Christ, still go to the temple, to the authorities, knowing that they are going to persecute Christ. Why would they do that? The same reason why John of the Cross, Teresa of Avila, Saint Francis, Saint Mother Teresa of Calcutta, stayed within the church, imperfect, partially impure, because they had the gift of docility to the Holy Spirit, which is essential to the gift to li of living in the divine will. That was first given to the servant of God, Louise, and anyone after her. So in that context, I will share with you the following passage that um, I alluded to earlier. Mary reveals it was the divine will that called us to accomplish this great sacrifice of presenting Jesus in the temple, and we promptly obeyed. My baby Jesus wanted to obey the Mosaic law by presenting himself in the temple to offer himself for the salvation of all. My child, when the divine fiat finds promptness in doing whatever it desires, it puts at the soul's disposal its own divine fortitude. 
its own sanctity and its own creative power to multiply whatever act or of sacrifice the soul accomplishes on behalf of each and every individual. The divine fiat places in the soul's sacrifice the little coin of infinite value with which one can pay the debts of all souls and offer satisfaction on everyone's behalf. It was the first time that your tender mother and St. Joseph went out in public together with our baby Jesus. And I'll skip a few paragraphs, a few sentences. The priest was Simeon, and as I placed Jesus in his arms, he recognized him as the divine word and exulted with immense joy. After offering, he assumed the prophetic role and prophesied all of my sorrows. Oh, how the supreme fiat sorrowfully resounded within my maternal heart, revealing the bitter tragedy of all the sorrows of my little son. But that which pierced me the most were the words that the holy prophet said to me, This beloved child will be the salvation and the fall of many, and the target of contradictions. If the divine will had not sustained me, I would have instantly died of pure sorrow. But it gave me life, and it used to form in me the kingdom of sorrows within the kingdom of the divine will. Therefore, in addition to the office of motherhood which I exercised over all, I acquired the title of mother and queen of all sorrows. Oh yes, with my sorrows, I acquire the little coin that pay to pay the debts of my children, even those of my ungrateful children. Now, little child, in the light of the divine will, I already knew all the sorrows I was to endure, even more than those which the holy prophet had foretold. But in that ever solemn moment of offering my own son and in hearing it all being repeated, I felt so pierced that my heart bled and deep furrows opened up within my soul. Now, before telling you Mary's lesson, did you hear what I just shared with you? Are you connecting the dots here? I'll give you the key sentence again to see if you're connecting this all. Mary says, I already knew all the sorrows I was to endure, even more than those which the holy prophet Simeon had foretold. What does this mean? Mary was given knowledge of the divine will. In her immaculate heart. Excuse me one second. Just at the moment I'm about to reveal to you something very profound. Believe it or not, my phone has not rang in about seven months. Nobody has the number. I don't even remember the number. And I'm sure the evil one's behind that. Now, Mary knew all the sorrows that she was to endure by the infused knowledge. This is found throughout Louise's writings, not just here in the Virgin Mary in the Kingdom of the Divine Will book, but it's also revealed in the volumes. Mary knew everything she was to endure before Simeon revealed these to her. And that's why she says, I already knew all the sorrows I was to endure, even more than those which the Holy Prophet Simeon had foretold. So, this means that Mary, knowing that the synagogue would abuse and refuse her child, who, was, who would become an adult, by blas claiming him to be a blasphemer, a non-taxpayer, a subversor, claiming himself to be a king to overthrow the Roman Empire. Thank you for joining me today on Meet the Author. I hope everyone had a... Excuse me, <laughs> that's, some, that's okay. There, uh, there, we have a new crew here working at Radio Maria, and sometimes the microphone cuts in and out by accident. <laughs> I, was, I, was, I think he was going to conclude for me. But um, yeah, even though Mary knew all these things in her heart, she still chose with Joseph to present the child Jesus in the temple. What does that tell us? Mary knew 
that Jesus would be excommunicated by Annas and Caiaphas. When the high priest tore his garment, when Caiaphas tore his garment, that was an act of excommunication. He cut off Jesus from the church, the very church he was sent by the Father to preach to and to share the good news with. They threw him out. Mary knew they were going to do this. And what does she do? She goes right to the same synagogue in which to offer up her son. She doesn't go outside of the church to reform it. She stays within it to reform it. This is docility. And this is what is lacking to those holy rollers, if you will, who believe they know more than the Pope, than the bishops, than the priests. Sometimes they do. Let us be, let us be honest. Sometimes they do. Sometimes the Pope may be wrong on certain civil issues, not on doctrinal issues. There's not been one reported history in the Church for over 2,000 years in which the Pope has preached anything heretical. People claim that, but it's false. And in fact, I put out a book showing that, citing all the cases of all the Popes, including Honorius and others, that say, oh, he was a heretic. No, they weren't. The Holy Spirit has preserved the Pope from hey, Christian voice all these years. Home. Okay, we're having more problems. We're having more problems with Radio Maria here. I see the microphones are being mixed up. I'm gonna, I'll talk to them when I finish this broadcast so that we don't have any more interruptions in the future. Hopefully they can, I don't think they can, they're all going to be able to eliminate these parts because I'm talking over them. So please be patient. Thank you for your patience. But I have another five minutes left. I don't know what's going on in the background there. Um, there um, this is being broadcast out of um, a state to where I am. So that's where the um, the um, discrepancy comes from. Okay, so resuming the thread of teaching, those who claim to know more than the Pope or the bishops, and sometimes they may, don't have the authority, as God the Father told Catherine of Siena, to become the self-appointed punishers and correctors of the Pope and the bishops and the priests. Okay? This is really what separates a person who wishes to become holy from a person who actually becomes holy, from a person who wishes to live in the divine will, from a person who actually lives in the, in the divine will. Without the virtue of docility that is cultivated by meditation and contemplation, reflection, in particular on this event of the presentation, Unless the person cultivates this gift, this virtue of docility, they cannot live in the divine will, not, not at least completely. They may enter into it and then exit, then enter into it and then exit. But to remain in the divine will and grow from the imperfect to the perfect to the complete mode, you have to cultivate this gift. Like Joseph and Mary did. Like St. Francis it, like Mother Teresa of Calcutta did, like St. John of the Cross did. So then Mary gives us the lesson in conclusion. Now listen closely to your tender mother in the pains and sorrowful encounters that are not lacking to you as you acknowledge the sacrifice of the divine will. Never lose heart, but promptly repeat your dear and sweet fiat by saying, whatever you desire, Lord, I desire. And with heroic love, let the divine will take up its royal place in your sorrows, same sorrows of representation, where Simeon prophesied her sorrows, which she knew in advance, so that your fiat may convert them, may convert your sorrows into a little coin of infinite value with which you will be able to pay your debts, as well as those of your brothers. By this means, you will ransom souls from the slavery of the human will and admit them as free children of God to the kingdom of the divine fiat. Indeed, the divine will is so pleased by the soul's acceptance of the sacrifice it asks of it. What sacrifice? By remaining within the church, respecting the authorities, in particular those that communicate the blood of Christ that it bestows upon the soul all of its divine prerogatives. Let me repeat that sentence. 
The divine will is so pleased by the soul's acceptance of the sacrifice it asks of it that it bestows upon the soul all of its divine prerogatives and constitutes it the queen of sacrifice and the source of the blessings that will reign in all creatures. So if you want to be the source of all the blessings creatures receive, the source, that's a huge word, then cultivate the gift of docility while living in the divine will. And God will bless you and protect you in the places where you live. He has promised this to us in Louise's writings. Mary has promised this to us in Louise's writings. It has been promised to us in the writings of other mystics approved by the Church. And may God keep you and bless you on this new year in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.